Hello everyone and welcome to Starts at 60's newest online masterclass. I hope that you and your families are keeping well in these difficult times. I'm Rebecca Wilson, your host today and the founder and CEO of Starts at 60. And if you're not already a part of the Starts at 60 community, I'll give you a quick overview of who we are. Starts at 60.com is the online home of the Australian Baby Boomer. We've got media, travel and insurance offers for you a great membership platform that gives you access to exclusive information and better deals as well. So get on over there and join up. Uh, it's free to join. But to do what we do, we work with partners who also really care about older Australians to provide information, products and services that you value. Today's masterclass has been created in partnership with Ingenia Lifestyle, the premier provider of lifestyle communities for over 55s. If you're interested in retirement income and property, Ingenia has some options you may want to consider. So a massive thank you to Ingenia Lifestyle for working with us on this. Now, before I introduce today's amazing panel of experts and we kick things off, I want to let you know how the session will run. We'll have about 40 minutes of discussion with our panel, then about 10 minutes to answer your questions. We have the chat function running at the bottom of your screen so that you can engage with other viewers while we're talking. We just ask that you please be nice and respectful to each other. Shouldn't have to ask that, but it is the internet. Um, we're not taking questions from the chat funnel there, um, only taking questions from the area uh, under Q&A. And that function is at the bottom of your screen also. Um, so make sure you type your questions in there if you'd like us to get you the responses from these wonderful panelists we've got with us today. If we can't address all of your questions in the question and answer session at the end, we'll follow up the most pressing ones in articles on Starts at 60 over the coming days and weeks. It's another great reason to sign up as a member. So to our panel. It feels like Noel Whitaker doesn't really need an introduction. Noel is Australia's best known financial commentator and you'll recognize him from his many appearances on radio and TV and from his weekly newspaper columns. He's written 22 books, including his bestseller, Making Money Made Simple. And I don't think there's anything we can ask him about money matters that he doesn't have an answer for, particularly around retirement. Rachel, um, I can say the same for Rachel Lane when it comes to all the things about retirement living. Rachel's the founder of Aged Care Gurus, where she oversees a national network of specialist advisors who are committed to providing great advice on downsizing retirement living and aged care. She writes a regular column for the Sydney Morning Herald, Melbourne's The Age and the Brisbane Times and is the editor at large of our downsizing hub here on Starts at 60. Rachel and Noel wrote the best-selling book, Aged Care Who Cares? And their most recent book is Downsizing Made Simple. And we'll send you all an offer on that later on today. And Adam, if you follow, um, the most the hottest and most controversial topics in politics business and the economy you'll recognize adam Crichton. he's the economics editor at the australian as well as the co-host of sky business weekend and a regular guest on 2gb and the abc plus he's worked at the reserve bank and as an advisor to tony abbott so if anyone knows how government decisions impact the finances of everyday australians he does what a panel i can't wait to be here for all of this today thank you all so much for joining us I want to make the most of your time, so I'm going to get straight on to the big topics. I'm going to start with Adam. The borders are closing, Victoria's in lockdown, and we're getting daily updates on COVID-19 case numbers. Talk about a vaccine is there too. Does anyone really know what this second wave of coronavirus means for the Australian economy? Well, good morning, everyone. And look, I have the, the rather sobering task of giving an overview of the economy, as you just suggested. Look, I think first I'll just go through kind of where we are, basically, in terms of the macro aggregates, and it's it's very sobering, as I said. So we're facing the biggest recession, you know, since the 1930s. You know, the Reserve Bank openly says this in its monetary policy statement. Uh, the job market is in a real mess, and I think I think in terms of the human cost of a recession, that's that's kind of the best place to look. I think to know what's going on now with the economy. Some 30% of the labour market are on some sort of government payment now. You know, it's almost a third. That is unprecedented in our history. So three and a half million workers are on on a job keeper, then there's another one and a half million on job seeker. Uh, for the first time in about at least a generation, uh, wages have started to fall. Uh, the wage price index actually fell in the June quarter. 
And pretty much the only strong part of the economy right now is the mining sector. We have been really, really lucky in Australia that the iron ore price has stayed high and it's basically stayed high because China has remained relatively strong. It was the first to enter uh, the coronavirus uh, pandemic, if you like, and the first to come out of it. And also there are still a lot of problems with the supply of iron ore in, in Brazil. So Australia in that sense has been, has been pretty lucky. But, but, but like I say, mining is really uh, the only strong place. Um, so all those figures are quite bad, but I've been describing this recession so far as a phony recession. And you can see why I've been calling it that, because I'll just show you a slide now, which has been put together uh, by McKinsey. And I think it really illustrates the extraordinary extent of government support uh, that has been pouring into the economy in recent months. Um, and you can also see clearly the drop off in that slide in the month of October, where there's a 40% drop in, um, in payments to households from the government. And I, we're just getting that, that, that slide up. Let me just check on the table. And then you'll also see sure in see. Uh, the month of January, uh, the payments almost completely drop off. And so, in these months right now, you know, in July, August, September, we're basically wallowing in extraordinary injection of income to households uh, from the government, which of course is built on, on growing debt, of course. And so I think a lot of people, even though these figures that I just mentioned before are shocking, you know, the fall in GDP, the rise in unemployment, you know, the highest jobless rate in a generation, I don't think we feel like a recession yet because actually household income, believe it or not, is higher this year than it was last year, right? which is pretty extraordinary. But that's not going to last. So my point is that I think the real pain of this recession is going to be over the next six months as we see that huge drop off uh, kind of. And I think I'm, I'm not sure what's happened with that slide. Sorry, but um, but maybe we'll get it up up soon. Yeah, um, hang on. And I'll just get the technical the, stuff going. And um, the and, other yeah, thing I wanted the... to point out about the future is there is you mentioned a vaccine, Rebecca. And, and yes, I mean, that is that is the working assumption that there is going to be a vaccine behind a lot of these economic forecasts. But of course, as you know, that's very uncertain. And even if there is a vaccine, it might not be very effective and so forth. So, you know, we really are in a, a time of extraordinary uncertainty right now. Uh, you know, kind of on the, on the brighter side, I guess, is that this is a very unusual recession. It's the first recession in the history of the country, which has been caused, if you like, by government restrictions. Most, most recessions are caused by the business cycle. They just happen, right? But, mm. but this time, to a great extent, it's been caused by state government shutting things down. And, and of course, it's had a very dramatic and sudden effect. But on the bright side, it might mean, it might mean that when those restrictions are lifted, there is a relatively quick bounce back as, as people suddenly rejoin the workforce. And as I just said, there's a lot of pent up uh, demand in the economy right now, I must say. So if you just look at, you know, no one's spending anything, for instance, on overseas travel, absolutely nothing. So all that money that would have been yeah. spent on holidaying overseas is just basically waiting to be spent on other things. So, so what does that do to the property market, Adam? I yeah. mean, we're hearing predictions about everything from huge drops in property prices to things staying pretty stable. How does that Yeah, well, look, the property market's just been remarkable. I mean, if you go back three months or so, you would have seen forecasts of 20%, 30% property price falls. Indeed, that's what I expected to happen, frankly, because it was pretty terrifying in March. You know, stock markets were absolutely routed. I mean, I think ours fell by almost a third. Of course, it's come back a lot since then. But uh, the doomsayers were proved very wrong. I mean, house prices, we actually just saw this morning. For last month, they fell, uh, the capital cities fell 0.4%. So they've fallen very slowly for about four months in a row. But, you know, for instance, Sydney is still 10% higher than this time last year. Uh, Hobart is up 11%. Uh, Melbourne is up 9.5% still on 12 months ago. So we cannot say that there's been any sort of route in the housing market whatsoever. Uh, now, listings are basically back to normal now. Of course, they're not in Melbourne. Um, auction rates to auction clearing rates are roughly back to normal, except in Melbourne, of course, where there are many restrictions still. So look, it's a real puzzle because rents have absolutely collapsed. Now, now the consumer price index said in the June quarter, the three months to the end of June, that rents, oh, we're, we're seeing that chart now. <laughs> So if I just briefly show you what I was talking about, you'll see the extraordinary drop off there in November, 38% fall in government payments to households. So $23 billion a month to $14 billion. That is extraordinarily huge and it's going to be felt. And then in January, it drops even more down to $7 billion. And then if you go to the end, it's basically gone completely by March, April next year. So my point is that these months, July, August, September, October, where we are now, we've been in this happy place where you know, people are not working. People are doing a lot less work, but they're getting more money but it's going to end. And I think the real pain of the, of the recession is in the future. But 
But just back to house prices again. <clears throat> So rents, I think certainly where I live in East Sydney, rents have collapsed by 20%, I would say at least, but seemingly house prices have not. Indeed, I just had my own apartment refinanced and I was bracing for the worst. I was expecting a massive reduction in the value from the bank, but actually they valued it 15% higher than I paid for it just two years ago. So I was very happy about that. I'm not sure if I believe it. <laughs> Good news. But, but, um, <laughs> but I think it just goes to show that uh, maybe it's you know the older Dodge safest houses. There's so much uncertainty in the world right now. There's so much fear about you know, the possibility of inflation outbreaks. You know, central banks are printing money all around the world. But I think you know, the, the safety of real estate certainly has some appeal to people. And of course, you've also seen a massive fall in interest rates. So, so we can borrow so much more now. So people's, if you have a job, if you're one of those lucky uh, public servants, for instance, who, who still are on full pay, uh, then, then you, know, you can borrow uh, like even more, right? So the white collar professionals who I would argue probably set the price of houses, they are largely okay so far, right? I think, I think the job losses have been very much uh, felt by younger people, uh, by lower earning people, and you'll find that they don't set the marginal price of houses. So, um, but, but that said, uh, you know, who knows what's gonna happen? We've got, of course, there's government stimulus on the way, the home builder a scheme, it's worth $600 million in aggregate. So I don't think it's going to shift the dial too much on uh, national house prices. I, I think that was more the appearance of doing something. Just, just one last point on house prices. And I think this is a really interesting phenomenon. You know, I was just talking to a friend in New York last night and he was telling me that you know, prices in Manhattan, the price of property has fallen by about 20%, but the price of houses in nearby suburbs, you know, maybe five, 10 kilometers away, had gone up 15%. And so I think we might see a similar phenomenon here. Whereas if this work from home uh, phenomenon continues, uh, then you may well see uh, the inner city apartments and even inner city houses fall in value relative to to properties a little bit further out. Indeed, not just within the capitals, but maybe in the regions too. So it could actually end up being a good story for regional towns in Australia. Well, that's interesting. So, Noah, what position does this put people in if they're thinking about retirement and their finances? Everyone was watching their superannuation balance in the first half of the year while financial markets were topsy turvy. And we still haven't got much clarity on that economic outlook, which can also have an impact on supers and investments. Tell us your thoughts. What you've got to do is go back to the basics. You know, there's, there's, there's a Reserve Bank decision today, which I think, think will be hulled. We can say fairly certainly that interest rates won't change for three or four years. You can't depend on money in, money in the bank. Our super funds have done well. I think if you've got money in super, leave it in there, but make sure you've got enough money in cash for the next three or four, the next three or four years planned expenses. You'll notice over 10 years, the growth funds have done eight and the capital stable have done almost six. You know, so um, trust your superannuation fund, but make sure you've got enough cash on hand for ongoings. Okay, and looking further out, a common worry we hear it starts at 60 is about running out of money and then having to readjust to living on the full age pension. Is that a reasonable concern for people? Well, basically, as your money drops, the age pension goes up. Every $100,000 of assets you drop, which is a hell of a big drop, you get an extra $8,000 of pension. So I think people need to budget well, uh, just their spending. Most people live with a fair bit of money. Most people die with a fair bit of money. The other catch-22 is that most people live longer than they think they're going to live. So it's a juggling act. Yeah. So just jumping quickly to Adam on that, you watch these government balance sheet issues associated with the pension quite closely. What are your thoughts on whether we continue to act or whether we can or should continue to act as if the pension will always exist? Mm -hmm. Well, look, I think the pension yeah, will exist, but let me just give, give some facts and figures about those government balance sheets that you just mentioned, because it's pretty horrifying what's been happening at the moment. So the federal government, of course, as, as I'm sure you all know, was expecting a small budget surplus this year. You know, it was very, very uh, widely telegraphed, but uh, it's looking more likely uh, for last financial year, the one just ended, uh, to be about $90 billion deficit. And this financial year that we're in now will be about $200 billion deficit. So that's that just, just an extraordinary turnaround of things in, in a very, very you know, rapid, in a very, very short period of time. So the Commonwealth's net debt, the federal government's net debt is gonna increase by 80% uh, to about 675 billion, um, at least according to John Edwards, who, who released, released an analysis recently at the Lowy Institute. Uh, 
he thinks by the end of 2030, uh, there'll be an extra $500 billion of debt that would not have otherwise existed, you know, but for this virus. Uh, so, and, and if you add the states and the Commonwealth all up, uh, the gross level of debt, so if you don't subtract the government's assets, will be about $1.5 trillion, which, which is the highest level since, since the Second World War. So um, it really is an extraordinary, uh, extraordinary turnaround. As you also probably know, the Reserve Bank is in part uh, funding uh, the government borrowing by effectively creating money out of thin air and purchasing uh, the government debt uh, from banks. So that's, that's somewhat controversial, but, it, but it's, it's really what central banks are doing all around the world. So it's just really playing catch up uh, with the rest of the world. Uh, just on your question about the pension or whether it's going to exist, look, um, I think it always will exist. And, and these are the reasons why. Well, firstly, uh, you know, people over 65 or, or kind of over 67 are a very large voting block. And I'd be surprised if any uh, government in a democracy uh, tried to alienate such an enormous group of people by switching off the age pension. They could perhaps do it prospectively, but this is really thinking outside the square. They could say, look, in 40 years time, right? If you're born after this point, you're not gonna get a certain pension. And you know, maybe people my age think it's so far away that they just go along with that, right? That's, that's one possibility, but, but I don't think it's likely. Um, but also the cost of our age pension compared to other countries in the OECD is, is fairly cheap, actually. So I actually checked this morning. So it's 11% of federal government spending, roughly, is the age pension. But the average in rich countries is 18.5%. So you get an wow. idea of basically how much less we're spending. Indeed, we spend the least amount in the OECD on the age pension uh, relative to total government spending um, compared to every country except for Mexico, Korea, and Iceland, right? So, and as a share of GDP, if you look at the figure differently, the age pension here, even in 2050, will be 3.7% of GDP, whereas the OECD average for 2050 is going to be 9.4% of GDP. And, and the reason why it's so much cheaper here, of course, is our age pension is not related to what you earn when you retire. It's just a flat rate, right, which makes it a lot, lot, lot cheaper. I'm sure a lot of people are going to wave that statistic around and if you say that too loudly around here because people really love that pension. I mean, what yeah, about your experience, well, I, Rachel? Do you find people seeking your advice keen to stretch their savings as long as they can? Yeah, look, that's, that's definitely part of it. Um, I guess people that are downsizing are typically downsizing for the lifestyle that it offers them. So... Yes, they're, they're looking at their investments and they're looking at how long do those investments need to work and how hard do they need to work so that they can afford that lifestyle. But typically, they're also looking at other things other than investments. So what we might call lifestyle assets, things like new caravans, new cars, new boats, um, toys. Uh, and sometimes they're also looking at giving money to kids or grandkids and, and things of that nature. So, I mean, it's not just about the money, if, if you like. It's more about the lifestyle that they're wanting to, to afford. And Noel, you had your... Well, basically, in the old days, your pension was a right. Now they think it's welfare. And they may well ask the question, if you're a couple with $800,000 in super, should you be on welfare? And these will be the questions being asked. I think the next thing is they'll, they'll, they'll include the family home. There's a lot of people who want this to happen. I mean, I don't. You know, but these are the questions they, they'll ask. I mean, the government can't get money out of, out of the air, can they? We've got $1.5 trillion of debt. It's pretty serious. Sure That's is. So, yeah. so, Noel, I've got another question for you. If I'm thinking about how to extend the life of my income outside the pension, what are my, what are my options? Extend the income outside the pension? Mm. Well, there's now some products available called lifetime income streams. Now, I, I think I've got one on the PowerPoint for you. Uh, was only 60% counts for the assets test. So you can put one of those, if you're a pensioner or near the pension cutoff point, you can, here we are here, yeah. So it's a bit hard for me to say, I've only half a screen there. But, but, but here's a couple, they use $200,000 to buy a lifetime income stream and only 40% 40% isn't counted for the assets test. They get a $12,000 a year pension increase 
and a $16,000 income. So that $200,000 gives them a $28,000 income. These are the kind of things to help people. That's 11% return, it's very good. Great to see product innovators coming, um, coming down the, the path of serving this generation as the needs of the generation change. We're hearing more about equi equity release as well these days, Noel. It makes sense when Australia's greatest source of wealth other than super is their home. But if someone does decide to downsize, what do they do with the money they free up to get the best return? Okay, the big problem is when you downsize, you're turning an exempt asset, the family home, into cash in the bank, which is accessible. So if you downsize, say, say you're in a $1.5 million house on the full pension, say 37 grand a year, here we are, and then you downsize to a $700,000 house and free up $400,000 of equity, your pension drops to 6,000 a year. So you're losing $31,000 of income. So I think the big thing for you is, well, I better off to stay in my house because a more expensive house ought to give me a bigger tax-free capital gain and just don't hurry to downsize. Because downsizing costs about 10% of the property you buy. So if you downsize to a, a $700,000 house, that's probably going to cost you seventy dollars or $80,000 in changeover costs. You know, that, that's a big chunk of capital. Yeah. So Rachel, if a retiree was to decide to downsize in order to increase their income or help their savings last longer, where can they go? Not everyone wants to live in a small flat. Yeah, and look, we've seen particularly in Sydney the issues that people have had with strata title. Um, and, and there's lots of options. So some people choose to live with family um, and in doing so they create a, a granny flat arrangement. Um, it's not something to be entered into lightly. Um, some people choose to enter into like a, a co-housing type arrangement with lifelong friends. Again, not something to be entered into uh, lightly. Um, other people go for more traditional downsizing options like retirement villages and land lease communities. And sometimes those two things get put under the one umbrella of retirement communities. But I always say that they're, they're a little bit like fruit. Yes, they're, they're both fruit, but one's an apple and one's an orange. And there are very big differences both in social security treatment, but also in the fees and charges associated with them. Um, between the two. So it, there are quite distinct differences between a retirement village and a land lease community. So, so whereas some people tend to put them together and think that they're the same thing. Yeah, okay. So the decision also has pension implications when you, you decide. Um, Rachel, given the income and assets test, so the key points to think around or think about around the age pension when looking at either downsizing or releasing equity? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, when it comes to granny flats and retirement villages from a pension point of view, they'll look at the amount that you pay and they'll compare it to what they call the entry contribution limit or the extra allowable amount. And at the moment, that's $214,500. You can see that on the screen there. If, uh, if you're going into one of those arrangements and you pay less than $214,500, then from a pension point of view, they will treat you as a non-homeowner. And as a non-homeowner, you get another $214,500 in your asset test threshold. But whatever you've paid for your home gets included. Wow. But the other upside so... to that is that you may qualify for rent assistance. If the amount you pay is more than $214,500, then the opposite is true. So you're a homeowner, whatever you've paid for your home is exempt but you won't qualify for rent assistance. In a land lease community, and that's why I said that they are quite different, in a land lease community, because of the, the unique ownership structure where you own your home, but you lease the land on which it sits, then you are both a homeowner and a tenant at the same time from a pension point of view, which means that your home is an exempt asset, but you can claim rent assistance on what they call the site fees which is the, the weekly or monthly rent that you pay to, to rent the land that your house sits on, but also to have the use of all of the amenities that are in that community, like the, the barbecue areas, the swimming pools, the gymnasiums, the clubhouse, all of those things, you're paying a, a weekly or a monthly rent to have access to all of that. 
Yeah, wow. Um, they sound like a pretty uh, impressive, um, uh, impressive type of facility. Um, so we've got the cost of each option to consider as we do sit here and try and understand where the downsides to. And I know a lot of the people that have joined us today are, are sitting on the edge of a, a huge decision. What's the best way to keep track of the costs and whether an option is a financial winner or not? Because it's really hard to judge for people. Okay, so it doesn't have to be complicated. You can literally take an A4 piece of paper like this one here and draw two lines across it so that you've got thirds. In the top box, write ingoing. In the middle box, write ongoing. And in the bottom box, write outgoing. And then itemise the fees that you're going to pay in each box. If you're looking at um, perhaps, you know, comparing one village with another village, or you might be comparing um, buying a cheaper house with buying a more expensive house, then you can draw a line down the middle and it's easy to compare the two side by side. The reason I say you might be comparing a cheaper house or a more expensive house is because of exactly what Noel was talking about before. Sometimes it, it, you're better off supersizing your downsize. So, what I mean by that is if, you, if you're comparing, say, a, a $400,000 home with a $500,000 home and you were going to be impacted by the asset test, then what you could find is buying the $500,000 home gives you an extra $7,800 a year of pension. So you may choose that because obviously if it's more expensive, it's probably a nicer house or better views or whatever, you know, whatever it might be but you may also find that your cash flow is much better under that scenario because put $100,000 in the bank or $100,000 in super and you might struggle to get that 7.8% that you need to replace the pension you're losing. It's an incredible insight, um, I have to say, and I know everybody here will be interested to know more. We are going to have another event in a couple of weeks and I'll tell you more about it later. Um, that takes us more deeply into the financial ramifications of particularly uh, the lifestyle community options. Um, now we've gone through the big starting points on downsizing, Adam. There is the issue of whether to do it now or sit tight and wait. And we're all watching this economy with curiosity. Based on the information you're hearing on the economy, what the government might do to manage COVID-19, What's the outlook for someone who is considering selling in, say, the next six months? What well, if I had a crystal ball like that, I'd be a very wealthy person. Uh, so it's very, very hard to say. Give us your best uh, shot. But look, I mean, surely, surely there's going to be a continued steady falls in house prices, you know, kind of across the board, I would say, because you're going to have rising unemployment. As I said earlier, when, those, when all those payments come off in October and then, and then early next year again, uh, there's going to be a lot less income sloshing around the economy. Uh, and also immigration has basically collapsed as well. I mean, I, I think a big, a big part of this is that, uh, you know, for the first time in many, many years, indeed in the federal budget, uh, the first time since 1916, we have the lowest, uh, the lowest population growth rate basically now since then. So in more than 100 years. So we've gone from, you know, having uh, one of the fastest population growth rates in the developed world by far. So just to give you an idea, last year, Australia's population grew three times as fast as the UK's, uh, three times as fast as the US's. You know, of course, from a much smaller base, but nevertheless, the growth rate is extraordinary. And our net overseas migration has been about 260,000 every year. Well, this year, it's going to be lucky to be 20,000, wow. 20,000. So there's going to be, you know, basically fewer people, there's, there's less need for, for homes. And yet, of course, there's, there's, you know, there's homes and apartments still in the pipeline, still being built. Uh, that are all going to be finished. So, you know, you're going to have more supply and less demand. So for that reason, I would think that prices are going to fall. But, um, but remember, if they, you've got to live somewhere. So if they're falling everywhere, it doesn't really matter. I mean, that your, your next house is going to be cheaper as mm -hmm. well. Uh, you know, notwithstanding that issue I said earlier about the, uh, you know, perhaps the changing relativities of house prices uh, compared to inner city, compared to outer suburbs, compared to regional areas, I think we're going to see changes there because of the whole work from home uh, phenomenon and you don't need to live as close to the CBD anymore for a lot of people. And so demand for those inner city properties is going to change. Um, so, yeah, so look, I would, I mean, if I was giving any advice, I would just buy and sell based on your stage of life, not what 
you think prices are going to do uh, because like I said, they're going to go up and down more or less everywhere and, and you have to live somewhere. You know, the other interesting factor to, to mention here is there's some talk in New South Wales, especially about uh, removing stamp duty and, and replacing it with a land tax, which, mm -hmm. which I think would, would have big ramifications because, you know, if you move, you're going to fork out so much money on stamp duty. It's just, I mean, it's a huge tax on moving. It really is really bad, I would say, for retirees because you, you know, you, you quite naturally don't want to move, but you don't want to pay $30,000 uh, to the state government, which is basically the cost of moving. Uh, if that well, you've got some thoughts on this. Oh, sure. I can't imagine the impost on retirees of a land tax on the family home. It would, it would be horrendous. Yes. Well, uh, if they're going to do it, it's phased in. Oh, yes. It's yes. also the, the implication. You're going to say it'll start in six months' time, then nobody buy for six months. You know, the, the, implica the implementation is impossible and the implications are frightening. Yes. I so think look retirees it's... should be aware of it and they, and they should fight it. That's my yes. opinion. The, um, oh, yeah. the, other, thing, the <laughs> other thing is that, um, that stamp duty doesn't apply in every, in every right. scenario. Yes. So we're, we've got to factor that into when I was talking about the ingoing, the ongoing and the outgoing. Um, yet definitely, if you're buying strata title, a apartment or townhouse or something like that, definitely you need to factor in stamp duty. But typically, uh, if you're moving into a granny flat arrangement, there's no stamp duty. If you're moving into a retirement village, unless it's strata title, there's no stamp duty. And if you're moving into a land lease community, there's no stamp duty. And that can make a big difference you know, in terms of ingoing costs of one over another, sure. like ten, tens of thousands of dollars. Also, I think it's dangerous to talk about the property market. I mean, the market could be booming here and falling here. So I think you need to understand what's happening in the market where you live, and see where it's going, and also what's happening where you, where you think you might buy. Because every uh, market, Sorry, to interrupt. Sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'll, I'll run on there because we've got lots of questions come in as well, which is really exciting. There's definitely a lot of food for thought. If you're interested in this topic, make sure you join Noel, Rachel and I for another online discussion at 1 p.m. on September 22. That's Australian Eastern Standard Time. You'll find the details on how to sign up for the event over the next few weeks on starts at 60.com and on all of our emails. So keep an eye out. Um, but let's get through as many questions from our community as we can right now. I'll start, up, uh, start off with one that was emailed to us ahead of our discussion. This one's for Noel. Um, and and um, yeah, we're gonna lead you off, Noel. I'm a 68 year old pensioner with a mortgage in no super, um, a small mortgage. My property would sell for um, close to 500,000 and I want to downsize, but what would be best to reinvest most of my capital into a smaller property? as there doesn't appear to be anything I could invest, any leftover capital after downsizing into that would return enough to subsidise the pension to a useful extent. I think the major point here is you need to have your own home. People in trouble are normally single people with no home. So whatever you do, preserve the home. Now, in June, you have got homes that you downsize too, I think. They start from Rachel, what, 195,000 or something. So yeah, I think about about 199,000. I think last time I looked. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Uh, there's also the cost of downsizing and, and that and uh, paying out the mortgage. But I mean, gee, you know, whatever you do, keep some sort of a home. It's, it's also exempt from Centrelink. Yeah. Uh, it would be, would be very difficult to try and rent and invest your money. The trouble is these days too, with all these uh, law changes. Go and see a financial advisor will cost you four or five thousand dollars. The average person has been cut adrift from financial advice. Um, so I just think, you know, your own home, downsize to it, and leave the rest in the bank. And that's simple. Okay. The next question is for Rachel. We're a couple, husband's 70, still working to earn a hundred thousand dollars a year and has a hundred thousand in super. The wife 60 is not working with a hundred and forty thousand in super. Our home is worth $380,000 and has a $140,000 mortgage on it. Uh, Rachel has seen this before, so she knows what I'm asking. We'd like to retire somewhere nicer, but suspect we can't afford it. How can we maximise our finances using downsizing, the age pension, super and part-time work? 
okay so <laughs> there's a lot of different one, elements. <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot of elements so i'll just touch on them otherwise um i'll be hijacking the webinar but uh, okay let's start with the the super question um the first thing about the super question that you need to ask yourself is why um because just because you can doesn't mean you should you need to understand what the benefits are to you of being in super and what the risks are um, noel often talks about the the widow tax with superannuation um, and and so you really do need to think about that um, like noel said you can you know be, because of the unique nature of a land lease community where you're just buying the house and you're leasing the land you can get houses that are much more affordable than if you were buying the house and land um, you know it might cost you five or six hundred thousand dollars to buy the house and land but because you're only buying the house component you might be able to get it for three hundred thousand dollars for example so that does enable people to downsize pay off their mortgage you know perhaps buy a caravan or a new car or something like that um, so you might want to explore those options um, some of the retirement villages that are out there will let you in for a cheaper price uh, and charge you a higher exit fee so that may be one of the ways that you could downsize if you're thinking about moving into a retirement village but you can't afford the upfront amount from uh, from an age pension point of view, I don't see that you're going to have too much trouble. There's some fantastic calculators on Noel's website that you can use to, to calculate it. But as a couple, assuming your homeowners in whatever you downsize to, you can have $401,500 worth of assets before your pension starts to reduce. And I just don't see that, that you're going to be in, uh, in that bucket. So I don't really see an issue with, with pension. Just think about that the added benefit of, um, of downsizing where you get rent assistance is that you could be eligible for that extra 130 odd dollars a fortnight on top of your age pension entitlement. Yeah, it's an impressive thing to look into. Um, a question for Adam next. Can modern monetary theory help us out in recovering from COVID-19? Can the government print money and keep it churning through the economy uh, as long mm, as we need it? That's a <laughs> That's a deep question. It's certainly one of the top questions now in economics around the world. Uh, look, I mean, my instinctive answer is no. I think if you look throughout history, when, when governments uh, take over their central banks and, and basically tell them to print money to pay for things, you'll, you'll eventually get a breakout in inflation, which you know, history shows is, is bad for everyone because then the, you know, the prices in the economy then don't mean anything. And so it's very hard to make judgments about the future when there's rapid inflation. That said, of course, we haven't had much much inflation now for you know for a good 20 years, and, and this has been one of the puzzles uh, for economists everywhere: why it's so low, uh, and it's it's certainly very low in Australia. I mean, it actually fell; the CPI actually fell over the 12 months to the end of June, um, and indeed rents, as I said earlier, rents rents uh, fell as well, just 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 in the three months to the end of June. So, if anything, we have zero inflation or deflation. Um, but look, I think when you know. Uh, you know, when you're in a crisis like we are now, I think people clutch clutch at straws and they clutch at things which which you know sound good in theory, uh, but in practice they don't work. You know, the the central bank governor Phil Lowe uh, gave a pretty strongly worded speech for a central bank governor about three or four weeks ago, where he said that you know um, modern monetary theory, although he didn't use those words, but he said you know basically creating money out of thin air to to pay for government expenses was not something the Reserve Bank wanted to do, and they've been very careful here to not to not give the money uh, directly to the government, but basically the government still has to issue bonds to pay for all its spending. It's, mm -hmm. not, it, it's not getting any money from the Reserve Bank at the moment. It's still issuing bonds. Uh, private banks buy those bonds and they sell them to super funds. They sell them to all sorts of funds around the world. Now, some of those bonds the Reserve Bank then, then buys with uh, newly created money. So you could say to some extent it's already doing this, uh, but on a limited scale. Uh, you know, the wow. risk I think is that, you know, central banks get carried away over the next three or four years because you know there's there's no uptick in inflation but then suddenly there will be and and then once that happens it'll be very very hard to rein it back in as as the 1970s you know show us where you have very high inflation and very high unemployment at the same time and that's kind of the worst of you know the worst possible world really i mean you could argue actually the current situation is pretty good where we don't have much inflation at all i mean that's kind of what economists wanted for many 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 years to have zero inflation and that's almost what we have, at least with consumer goods. As you know, with asset prices, there's certainly not zero inflation, it's gone up a lot. But 
but for consumer goods, uh, yeah. So look, I, I don't think MMT is the answer to, to give you a short, uh, you know, a short answer to your question. Uh, yeah, so. Um, I've got now, uh, and thank you, Adam. Um, I am, uh, the next question is for Rachel. I'm 73 and work two days a week. I receive a part age pension and I have about 300,000 in my super. I want to sell my home and buy something smaller, then put the 300,000 from the house proceeds into my super. That would leave me with between 200 and 300,000 and I'm not sure what to do with this money. Should I gift it to my daughter by giving her the money to buy her own place or pay off her hex debt? Or could I buy a property with her or buy one on my own, then rent it to her? Or should I just put it into an interest-bearing account? And what are the implications for my pension? This is an interesting one. Rachel and Noel are going to have a lot to say about this. Okay. Um, okay, so you're talking about a lot of different options. And obviously, I can't give you financial advice. Um, if you need advice, I would strongly encourage you to get advice from someone who specialises in this area. And we do have a panel of those advisors on our website. Uh, and you can choose one that, that is closest to you. I guess some of the things at a high level that you need to think about is you're talking about having $900,000 worth of accessible assets after you've downsized the home. You know, the $300,000 that's there, the $300,000 that, that comes from the home into the super, plus the $300,000 outside. So that will, uh, that will wipe out your pension entitlement. If you gift, whether you gift uh, in the form of paying off a hex debt or you gift in the form of cash, um, if you gift, that money will be held as an accessible asset. So exactly the same as if it was in your bank account for the next five years. Um, the, you can wipe off $10,000 of that gift straight away if you haven't gifted uh, in this financial year. So the allowable gifting amounts are $10,000 per financial year, but no more than $30,000 in any five year period. So um, that's the amount you're allowed to gift. The amount above counts as an asset is deemed to earn income. So you need to think about that part of it. And, and when it comes to the super, like I said before, just because you can doesn't mean you should. Um, assuming that your daughter is not a financial dependent, um, then you would want to be very, very careful of what Noel calls a death tax. In, Noel, do you want to explain the death tax from superannuation? You've got my next question, actually. What's the widow <laughs> Sorry, tax, Jack. Noel? That, somebody's asked it. <laughs> okay. All superannuation has a taxable and non-taxable component. When you die, the taxable component has a death tax of 17% if left to a non-dependent. That's what you've got to watch. But also, I'm very concerned about the thought of buying a house to rent the daughter because then you've got capital gains tax when you die. I would have thought one of those lifetime income streams would be just the perfect investment because you would get your assets down enough, get the pension and the cards and things, and a lifetime income stream. I think that would get the pension and give you certainty. What do you think, Rachel? Uh -huh. Yeah, I, I think uh, one of those lifetime income streams balanced with um, with assets outside. So one of the things with the lifetime income streams is that you are locking those assets uh, away. Um, so you, you would want to keep some form of um, emergency fund. I, I call it, you know, the pillow fund. What can you sleep at night knowing that, you know, you've got that much money at your liquid, you know, at your disposal. For some people, the answer to that is $500. To, for some people, <laughs> the answer to that is $500,000. Everybody right. has their own pillow factor. Right. Um, right. But you do need to have, you know, that amount of money there so that if there was an emergency or you did want to buy something, whatever it might be, that you have access to funds. That's fantastic. I um, have another question for you, Rachel. We'll be covering this in more depth in our second webinar on September 22. But in brief, what's the difference between a lifestyle community or a land lease community, both the same type of facility and a retirement village? Because they are two different categories. Yeah, yeah, they are. They're, look, they are, in terms of what they offer, they're very similar. So, um, Typically, you have a community of like-minded people. They all live in independently in their own homes. You have communal facilities like, you know, movie cinemas and swimming pools and clubhouses and barbecues and bowling greens and all of those sorts of things. But 
from a, a legal and financial perspective, they're very different. Typically, uh, and this is talking very generally, but for the most part, retirement village contracts are either a leasehold or a license arrangement. There are some legacy contracts around where it, um, there are a few strata title, there are company title, which is where you need to buy um, shares in a company or units in a unit trust for your right to occupy your unit and use the facilities. Um, but generally the contracts are leasehold or license arrangements. In a land lease community, or a lifestyle village as they're often called, um, sometimes they call them an over 55s community, then you buy your home and you lease the land on which it sits. So your lease is over the land, not over the house and land, if that makes sense. And that's why people who live in land lease communities are able to claim rent assistance and why typically people in retirement villages can't because as a general rule, the purchase price will be more than the $214,500 threshold in the retirement village and in the land lease community. But in the retirement village, that then knocks you out of eligibility for rent assistance. So um, it's one of those things when you, when you look at it, a lot of people find that the site fees, which is the, the, um, the rent that you pay for the land and the communal facilities in the land lease community, once you offset that with the rent assistance, they're really quite affordable. One of the other big differences between retirement villages and land lease communities is that a lot of land lease communities don't charge exit fees. So that can make a difference, not just in tens of thousands, we can then get into hundreds of thousands of dollars of difference. Um, and typically in a land lease community, you're also getting all of the capital gain, of course, with all of the capital gain comes the costs associated with getting that capital gain, like you might need to renovate and meet real estate agents fees and things like that when you go to sell. And it also comes with the risk of all of the capital loss when you go to sell your house. So they're really, even though people tend to put them together as a homogenous thing, they are really very, very different. So it's important um, and it's not to say that one is right, one is wrong, or one is better than the other. They're just different. So if you're thinking about downsizing into a retirement community, you need to look at your contract through three lenses. You need to look at it through the lens of what will it cost you and, and break it down into the ingoing, ongoing and outgoing. You need to look at what are your rights and you need to look at what are your responsibilities and make sure that your contract reflects what you're happy to accept. Yeah, I mean, that, that's really important. And I'm looking forward to your next session on the 22nd of September, because I, I know the books you've written and, and with Noel, they oh, break down. You mean this you one, Beth? That one? <laughs> <laughs> and we're going to give everybody who's come well today a special offer on that book today. Um, we'll, we'll send it out by email um, to you directly. But... But most importantly, like we want to make sure everybody is enabled with the right information about community living because about 17, 18% or perhaps even more of the Start City community has said they are interested in contemplating village life. So it, it's an extraordinary statistic and it's really good for the industry to see that people can get access to community and the feelings and the, the lifestyle associated with it. But the contracts, the financial decisions, they're what stands between here and there for everybody. And, and the biggest regret, like, you know, I, I've been working with people moving into retirement communities for more than 15 years. And I can tell you the biggest regret that they have is that they didn't make the move sooner. Yeah. But, but it can be hard to make the move when you don't have answers to all your questions. So well, we're sometimes, make that you know, for, people, yeah, to people make sure people know delay because it. they can't mm -hmm. get their answers. So just, I always say to people, don't think that there's a silly question. The silly question is the one that you didn't ask. Just keep asking questions until you've got all your answers and you can make that move with certainty. Yeah, great. Well, look, we're going to ask people to send in questions in advance of the next session. Uh, it's a whole hour devoted to uh, a more detailed look at lifestyle communities and the difference between a retirement community, but really focused on lifestyle. Uh, and we'll also be running other events throughout the year about downsizing and, and community living because it's such an important topic. Adam, my next question is for you. This is a hard one. 
Do we know what proportion of retirees actually take a proportion of government pension versus mm. those being self-funded? Yep, no, I do roughly know the answer to that. So as far as I understand, four-fifths of uh, people of pension age get either a full or part pension. And that, that four-fifths has been very, very steady for a very long time. What, what has been changing over the past 20 years, or basically since, since compulsory superannuation started in, I think, 1992, is that the share of, of that four-fifths who are on a part pension has been increasing. And my understanding is probably about 40% say are on a full pension and maybe maybe 40, 30% on a part pension now. So, you know, one of the big controversies about superannuation right now, and it's a big political issue, is, you know, why is that number still four fifths? Uh, you know, why is it still so high? Uh, you know, we've had this, we've had compulsory saving for, you know, 25 years, more than 25 years. Uh, and it doesn't seem to be, you know, making huge inroads into that figure. Now, of course, a proponents of super say, well, it was never meant to, it's about having extra money. And of course, there are questions with the asset test, which we've just been discussing, the income test for the pension. You know, that is obviously heavily related to how much uh, saving affects who gets the pension. Um, so yeah, so look, the answer is, is four fifths. I mean, it's interesting, it's worth mentioning right now, the government is sitting on this 600 page uh, review of the retirement income system, which, the, you know, which, which could lead to very significant changes to the age pension test, to superannuation, I mean I, I mean, I would argue it should. I really hope it does. I've written so much about it in the paper, just the immense complexity of the system. I mean, this, you know, more than half of our discussion today has been about these extraordinarily complex rules, which, you know, the government creates, you know, out of thin air and they just make everyone's life so much more difficult than it, than it needs to be. I mean, my kind of dream is that everyone gets the age pension. doesn't matter how much money you have, what your assets are, flat rate. Once you turn 67, you get it. Then you don't have to worry about any of this other stuff and you just make decisions about what suits you. That's what New Zealand does, actually. They give everyone the pension. There's no super. You just get the pension and you make up your mind whether, whether you want to save more or less. You and have really a, lot like of, a lot of fans in our community, Adam. Really? <laughs> well, <laughs> a lot of it's fans. Ex it's expensive. It's expensive I've to been do told that, it's a fairly, I've been told it's a fairly small pension, though. So, yeah, well, it's, I mean, New Zealand's a poorer country than Australia. There's no question. It's about 20% poorer. So they can't afford as much as we could. But, but, you know, super costs the government so much money. Like the tax concessions are far, far greater than, uh, than the reduction in, in age pension payments. So if you could somehow get rid of it, the government would save a fortune and then it could give everyone a pension and it could cut income lot. tax too. Uh, Just a lot. Okay. Yeah, now, Noel, I yeah. have some questions to finish off today. Um, people have written in and asked clarifying questions about some of the things you've said. Um, yes. Obviously, you've got a very large following out there um, in the community. So when you say cash, do you mean in the bank or in super or a cash component? Well, when I say cash, it means an investment which can't fall when the market falls. It could be a bank account. It could be capital guaranteed inside super. Uh, it's it's something that you can depend on. Yeah, okay. If you've got money in shares, whether they can rise and fall, and you've money in property, you can't sell the back steps. This is cash. If you need it, it is there for you. Okay. I've got another one for you now because lots of people have, have written in to ask more questions. With the challenge of lifetime income stream that we've talked about, on your desk, does this product have a residual payment to your estate? Do your dependents get any money back? And why would you choose the lifetime income stream over, say, creating an income stream from super? And is a lifetime income stream exempt from the assets and income test for pension, uh, for, for pensions purpose? Okay, now these lifetime income streams are a new product because the government's trying to solve the problem of people not spending enough because they don't know how long they will live. That's why it's sixty percent. Only it's it's only forty percent. You lose. It's says sixty percent for the assets, and sixty percent for the for the income test. So it's to encourage people to take one. Now every annuity is tailored to the person. There is no blanket annuity. It's tailored. It's tailored for you. I mean, obviously, if you took it out now and died next week, you probably get a fair bit back. Mm -hmm. So the annuity has got to be tabled for your own conditions. Okay. The index. Right, so, well, you know, there's all uh, sorts. The, of, sorry. There's all sorts of, of conditions, but the element of the income stream to be to be exempt for the pension has to be a lifetime income stream. 
I think that answers the question around death, hey? It's designed to let people have the income stream and they can spend it. Right. As, as, as Rachel said, you also need money outside that. Uh, maybe a flexibility. Yeah. Yeah, great. And then another one for you, Noel. Uh, yeah. Can 65 year olds add to their super without working? A lot of us have elderly parents who are leaving money, and I would prefer to put money into my super than struggle with shares myself. Fine. Okay. Two things there. They've just changed the work test. You can now go to 67. It's no longer 65. Mm -hmm. Don't forget you can have the same assets outside super as inside super. You could have to have the XYZ fund inside super, the XYZ fund outside super. Yeah, right. Most people, they like it being in super, then all the work's done and they get a monthly income from it. For most people, it's easier, that's all. Well, I think that's all we've got time for today, everybody. So thank you very much. Um, at the end of this event, the video will be live on startsat60.com for everybody to be able to come back and uh, review any of the detail. And you'll also see follow-up stories on our site, on Facebook, and on our email newsletters. And don't forget that next downsizing event on September 22, where we'll talk to Rachel and Noel again in more detail about downsizing options. In the meantime, I'd like to thank our fantastic panel Thank you so much for making the time today. You've answered some very big questions um, for people across what is a very challenging economic time um, and really challenging for people to make downsizing decisions right now. So we're really, really blessed to have had you with us. I'd also uh, like to thank Ingenia Lifestyle, uh, who have a sponsor for today, Australia's premium operator of lifestyle communities for over 50s. Um, you can find out more about Ingenia at our next event, or please, I encourage you to visit their website, ingeniacommunities.com.au. And I'm going to spell that for you, I-N-G-E-N-I-A, communities, C-O-M-M-U-N-I-T-I-E-S.com.au. Um, they, they really have got a very interesting um, portfolio right across the, the lifestyle communities landscape that that is very interesting to understand. Um, we hope we'll see you all again soon for more discussion on these super interesting topics about downsizing. And in the meantime, please stay healthy and safe and see you soon. Bye-bye.